Good morning and welcome back to AM Joy. This morning at Wembley Stadium in London, the New Orleans Saints collectively took a knee before the national anthem ahead of their game against the Miami Dolphins. Three Miami Dolphins players also kneeled. Taking a knee reached a flashpoint last weekend. But the story of how the national anthem came to be a staple in American sports goes back way much further or much further in 1814 Francis Scott Key penned the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner after witnessing the American flag still flying over Fort McHenry during the War of 1812 at, and at almost a hundred years after that after that battle President Woodrow Wilson declared the song the national anthem by executive order after his daughter, Margaret Woodrow Wilson, recorded a popular rendition of the military ditty in 1915, cracking the top 10 in sheet music sales. That's what you're hearing right now. Three years later, during game one of the 1918 World Series, the Boston Red Sox faced the Chicago Cubs against a backdrop of war. At that point, more than 100,000 American soldiers had died in World War I. Major League players were being drafted, and Americans in and outside the ballpark were weary and anxious. During the seventh inning stretch, the band struck up the Star Spangled Banner, and Red Sox third baseman Fred Thomas, on leave from the Navy, turned toward the flag and gave a military salute. The New York Times reported that the crowd sang along, ending the melody with thunderous applause. Babe Ruth pitched a shutout that day, and the tradition of playing the anthem at games was born. Though Congress wouldn't pass a law making the Star Spangled Banner the official national anthem until 1931. Today, it's the NFL's turn to use the anthem to stir up patriotic fervor in fans, while the President of the United States has decided to make it all about him. And joining me now is Michelle Bernard of the Bernard Center for Women, Politics, and Public Policy, Anusha Hossein of Forbes, Martin Lewis, producer and columnist, David Litt, author of the new book, Thanks, Obama, a speechwriter's memoir, and former NFL punter, Chris Cluey. Thank you guys very much for being here. And Chris, I want to go to you first because there is this whole question uh, of the use of the Star Spangled Banner of the National Anthem to sort of stir up patriotic fervor, fervor but also as a way that professional sports leagues market themselves in a certain way to fans. Do players feel like they are in the midst of, of sort of a marketing performance at that point? Or at this point, is it just sort of, you know, a, a part of the game? What, what, I mean, just from the player's standpoint, does it feel like they are on display? Yeah, from the uh, player's standpoint, it very much was a part of just what you did as part of the game. I mean, we had it in our schedule, you know, an hour before the game, go out, warm up. 30 minutes, come back inside to get your last last stuff in to get ready. Um, go back out on the field 10 minutes before to stand for the anthem and then play the game. And so I know you know it, it, it was part of the game, but I think we have to take a look at the inherent assumptions that lie within the, the national anthem where it is politicized. There are politics already in our sport when we nationalize the idea of sports. When we say, hey, you have to be a patriot to watch these games, that you, you have to salute the flag or stand for the flag to watch these games, that's taking us in a very fascistic direction. And, you know, David, it, you worked for President Obama, who was constantly challenged as to his sort of fundamental Americanness, including by the guy who's currently president of the United States. And sort of his background was constantly uh, challenged and politicized. What do you make of the current president deciding to sort of wrap himself in the Star Spangled Banner and take what is a protest about police brutality and turn it into a display of either total Trumpian patriotism or or, you know, apostasy against the United States. Well, Joey, one of the reasons I wrote a book called Thanks, Obama, I wanted to remember what it was like when a president knew his words mattered. President Obama, when he spoke about Colin Kaepernick and he spoke about the NFL and these protests, he was very nuanced. He talked about how people on both sides might be frustrated, but that fundamentally the right to protest is an American right. And it's no surprise Donald Trump is not taking a nuanced approach. The man has no capacity for nuance. But it's sad that he's making this about himself. It's sad that he's making the NFL and sports just another element in his culture war. And I think we see that time and time again with Trump. We're seeing it in Puerto Rico. People are desperate there. And for Trump, it's all about Trump. It just comes down to, is this good for Trump? What can I say that will fire up my base? It's not right. 
And Anusha, you know, you, you had Teen Vogue, which has become like, it's also become a sort of a political Bible in a lot of ways uh, in the things that they write there. And there's a, a piece on Thursday that says the president is manipulating the symbol of the flag and corresponding concept of patriotism as an extension of his power. And that's about as un-American as it gets. Your thoughts? I also think he doesn't, first of all, he doesn't understand why these people are protesting in the first place. Clearly. And second of all, he doesn't understand the history and that this country is built on not only on the right of protest, but how interlinked sports and politics are in this country. I mean, just look at the 60s and the 70s and Muhammad Ali and his relationships not only with Malcolm X, but Martin Luther King. So him making this about the flag not only is completely missing the point and is making this such a divisive um, conflict, but also he's completely missing the fact that not only do these players have the right to, but there's a history behind this as well. Yeah, and Michelle, you know, I do, you know, and the, 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 when our, my producer and I talked about doing this segment, the, the worry that we had is that we don't want to join in the sort of public decision to make these protests about the flag, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it isn't. It is literally a protest which each of these players is saying. There's another op-ed that was out not long ago by a player saying, no, we want to have a conversation about police brutality. Yeah. It's a long history of athletes using that moment whether it was in 1968 in the raised fists or now, to talk about an issue that's of importance to people of color. So what do you make of the idea that Donald Trump has managed to actually change the conversation to a conversation about the flag? Well, if there's anything that you can say Donald Trump does well, he gets an A-plus for changing every important conversation that we have in the country. And, you know, and I'll say, you know, to just piggyback on what you said, I don't think it's that he doesn't understand. I think that he is demonstrating that he doesn't care, mm -hmm. you know? And for the first time in U.S. history, you know, you always see people with these signs. I love this saying because it's so apropos where people say black people were not considered lazy until they decided to stop working for free. <laughs> well, black people are not, we're not, just, you know, we're not considered to be unpatriotic until, you know, Colin Kaepernick decided to take a stand and say that he is using the First Amendment right, one of the most important rights mm -hmm. under the U.S. Constitution that we all love to say that we will not stand for the murder of unarmed black men and black boys all over the country. And what has happened is we see case after case where there are no convictions and the country has become numb to it. It doesn't make headlines anymore. Yeah. It's not at the top of the national discourse. Um, it is an issue that is so absolutely important. And Donald Trump knows that. And what he is telling the American public is, this is my America. Remember during the McCain campaign, there was a commentator who said, the real Virginia? Well, he's saying, Donald Trump's America yeah. is the real America, and your lives don't matter. And Martin, I am very curious to, to, to know what you make of all of this. As somebody you know, is born outside the United States and is looking at us sort of from, a, you can look at us from a more global perspective. What do you make of this whole debate? The whole thing is really perplexing. Um, you know, there are 193 nations on this planet, and the citizens of those nations all are proud of their country. They're proud of their flag. They're proud of their national anthem. However, practically alone amongst developed democracies, America is the only place where they use the national anthem every week, every day, practically, for sporting <laughs> events. It's kind of, it's like a super, supercharged patriotism, as though if you don't salute the flag and the anthem, then something wrong you're not supporting America this is kind of crazy so it goes back to then um, there's also some appreciation of the irony a lot of people say Americans don't do irony nonsense the melody of the Star Spangled Banner was written by a British guy in circa <laughs> 1776 right. uh, mm -hmm. and it's a drinking song it and is. a song about womanizing there's yeah. even a reference <laughs> in the third verse to the yellow haired God and his nine fuss Maids. Now, <laughs> according to what our current president, the yellow-haired god, told to Howard Stern and Access Hollywood, it was more like 900 fusty maids. Put that to one side. The lyrics were written by a gentleman who was a slave owner, yeah. and his, uh, his version of a solution to the problem of there being blacks in America was mass deportation to Africa. So yeah. is it really appropriate that this song, which was only... Uh, turned into the national anthem by congressional order in 1931 is the is our national anthem perhaps it should be america the beautiful or this land is uh, your land mm -hmm. these are beautiful songs is it written in stone that we cannot change the national anthem and last but not least the third verse of the star spangled banner which is not often sung certainly not by roseanne Barr, we hope um, the third verse has appalling references to slaves yes. and it's mm -hmm. just disgusting so maybe 
maybe we should consider whether this is an appropriate anthem. Well, it's interesting because at the time that it, uh, that the national that the Congress debated whether to make this executive order by Woodrow Wilson law, that was one of the debates. And America the Beautiful was one of the songs people said was a better was easier to sing yes. and was actually yeah. just as popular. So it was just sort of by chance because Woodrow Wilson's daughter had a hit with it. Yeah. That's why it's a national anthem. And that's your choice, isn't it, too? It, America well, the Beautiful. There you yeah, go. I think America the <laughs> Beautiful is a beautiful song. And, and Chris, you know, I, there is an, an aspect to it though uh, that. I wonder whether the athletes on the field are, are, are getting this dichotomy, right? That they're being made uh, to be a part of a debate about patriotism. Um, this whole thing of kneeling before the anthem even starts, which sounds like a bit of a capitulation to Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, the idea that the league did enter, or the teams, I should say, the, the NFL's very sticky about it, uh, the teams did enter into these deals, you know, that John McCain really criticized in 2015, they ended in 2015, um, to sort of do patriotic things during the game. Do the players get that dichotomy between that and what the black players are saying they want to protest about? Um, I don't know that the majority of the players do because for, for a lot of the players, I'm sure they, they want to stick together. They want to show that, hey, you know, this, this is a brotherhood. We're going to stand up for each other. But the fact remains is that protests aren't supposed to be comfortable. Um, protesting should be kneeling during the national anthem. It should make people re-examine their, their preconceptions. And the fact that it's being shifted into this, oh, well, we're all in this together. We're going to kneel beforehand and then stand with arm, arms linked during it. It does a disservice to what the original idea of Colin Kaepernick's protest was, which was to protest police brutality. In yeah. America right now, the social contract is not being upheld. There are ci American citizens that are not receiving the same rights as other American citizens, and, and that's what this protest is about. Our country is supposed to be everyone has the same rights, everyone is treated equally. And until we reach that point, then you know, we still have a lot of work to do. And, you know, Anusha, these are businesses, the NBA, the NFL, the Major League Baseball, and they're businesses that cater to a very mass population. They want to make sure they don't offend any of their potential uh, customers. You now have the NBA, which is actually, if you look at donations, et cetera, to the left of the NFL. The NFL owners yeah. are far to the right, many more Trump donors, et cetera. The NBA has now issued an edict saying there will be no protests at all by NBA players or else. Yeah. What do you make of that? I think that's exactly what is so what is so terrifying about Trump. I mean, he really is kind of a magician when it comes to this, not only to detracting attention from what it's about, but where is America going when we are not allowed to do what, we are not allowed to speak our mind. We are not let, taking away the right to protest. So this is something that's really peacefully. Exactly. And you know, I come protest. from a country yeah. and I was born in a country, you know, where I'm from in Bangladesh, where this kind of stuff can happen. And the reason America is as great as we are is because you are the, the, the fundamental right to protest. So I think it's really terrifying with the controversy that's surrounding the NFL that now the NBA is saying no protests in our game. I mean, wh yeah. what's next? And David, you know, I wonder if you could anticipate. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, like, what is the country coming to when you look at the NBA, you look at the NFL, you look at the, you know, the overwhelming number of black athletes exactly. in these leagues, yeah. exactly. and what the country is saying is to these, you know, these big black burly men is, beat yourself up on the football field, play basketball, and shut up. And like, shut up. that's yeah. all we want be happy. That is what all you, you are good for, yeah. to entertain us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that is the bit Donald Trump would concur with that message. And also, yeah. how they're being portrayed as being yeah. ungrateful, ungrateful yeah. for how much money they are being paid. Come Completely missing the yeah. point, Shane. David. I'm, I'm curious if you were still, um, if, if if Barack Obama were there, you know, and not to make everyone in the audience wistful and cry, <laughs> but if Barack Obama was still there, how do you think he would respond to this same moment that we're having this debate? Well, or how? Yeah, go I, I can tell you how I would respond if I had asked to write a speech about something like this, because I think what we would be looking for is a way to get above the controversy of the moment, uh, totally the opposite of Trump, where he dives into the controversy the short term. We would be thinking, what's the big picture here? How are we really more united than we think? And the truth is, sports can unite us. I mean, when President Obama mm -hmm. welcomed mm -hmm. sports teams to the White House, it wasn't because they supported him or didn't support him. It was because he knew that these were American moments where, as fans, we don't have to be Democrats or Republicans. And we would look for examples of players who were giving back outside the field, off the field, trying to help their communities, showing that it doesn't always have to be about politics. You can help your community as a Democrat, a Republican. This isn't about party. And I think that's one of the things that, um, I, if I were sitting down and working on a speech about this right yeah. now, that's what I'd be thinking about. Where, where are, how can we be more unified than we realize? Because I bet we are. And I bet that there are plenty of people who love the national anthem and enjoy it at games, but also say, 
kneeling at the national anthem, that's just as American as playing the national anthem. And, and Martin, you know, um, uh, uh, it's it, it, it's just difficult to sort of unpack sort of what all this means for everyone else. But do you think that we might be going back to an age when, without the president of the United States sort of being able to exhibit that kind of moral leadership, are we now starting to see the re the resumption of athletes as sort of moral leaders? Well, certainly one thing that I find admirable is that when sports uh, sports players uh, are actually doing something that's not for their own personal benefit, none of the uh, uh, perfor, uh, players who have taken the knee are doing it for their financial benefit. It's right. not, say, like a politician who might propose a tax, uh, tax reform that would give $750 <laughs> million dollars benefit to his family. It's yeah. not for personal gain. It's because they have honor. And I'm reminded of this thing. When they keep invoking the flag and the national anthem, is to understand that the flag and the national anthem are not the things themselves. They are emblems, they're symbols. And I'm reminded of a great line in that movie, A Few Good Men, where a Marine has been dishonorably discharged and he's very despondent. And the Tom Cruise character says, you don't need to wear a patch on your arm to have honor. You don't need to sing a song or salute a flag to have honor. And those who are saluting in their own way racial fight, the fight for racial justice, for civil rights, those are core American values. And using the, and the First Amendment gives them that. So I think it's disgusting that you have this sense of division that prevents people or attacks people for doing what I think is patriotic. Indeed, to attack them is in itself un-American. Well said. Well, uh, we're going to leave it right there. So thank you very much, Michelle Bernard, Anusha Hossein, Martin Lewis, David Litt, and Chris Cluey. Thank you guys very much. Great panel. And up next, the President of the United States, uh, is he violating the First Amendment? My next guest says, yes, he is. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.